thanks, Hamish, and, and it's lovely to see everybody. Um, uh, I find it slightly scary that I've known Hamish for that long, although given how old he looks, perhaps it's not so surprising. Um, I, um, I feel really warmly about both Nuffield College, and we've got lots of Nuffield College alumni here tonight, and also the Oxford University. Oh, I still think of it as the Oxford University Business Summer School, and I imagine there are people here who still call it by that name. Um, and I feel particularly fondly about it because uh, the Oxford University Business Summer School in 1986, when it was less than half as old as it is now, was the first place that I ever went uh, other than a university, or well, I suppose it was in a university, but it was the first place I was ever paid to talk about economics other than by a university. And that was pretty exciting for me. I can still remember the piece of furniture that we bought with the £150 that I was... Uh, now, of course, £150 was not very much money then either. But, uh, but no, I, and, and I then went back uh, summer after summer to it. I think it is a great example of trying to bring uh, the insights of the academy and the insights of... of other parts of the world together. And that's really critical. It was a critical part of Lord Nuffield's uh, idea when he set Nuffield College up. He said he wanted Nuffield College to be a place for cooperation between academic and non-academic persons. And I think that's a great thing to be seeking to do. And, and so it's, it's wonderful to be part of this. I'm going to talk about social care. Um, a kind of obvious thing to say about social care is that actually it's one of those things that people, people use the words a lot, but often don't really know what they mean until they have direct personal contact with it. It's a bit like, I can remember as, a, as a, an undergraduate, thinking, what, it, what on earth do these economic textbooks mean by unity? You know, when you say elasticity is unity, why don't we just say one? You know, why, you know, why don't we just say one? People talk about fiscal policy a lot. If you ask most people, even most social scientists, what they mean by fiscal policy, they haven't really got any well-defined kind of idea. And, and that's true of social care as well. That's partly because it's a very broad thing, but partly because we just don't hear as much about it as we should. Um, it's also partly that it's quite difficult to work out where the line really is between health care and social care. So by social care, we mean uh, care when you can't look after yourself. We mean care when you need help to eat or dress or go to the loo or move about. But that's not honestly very easily distinguished between some other sorts of health care. We mean the kind of care you need when you've got dementia. But we're not very clear about why care that you need when you've got dementia should be treated in different ways, if it is, to the care you need when you've got uh, pancreatic or ovarian cancer. We mean by social care the kind of care you need when your arthritis is so bad that you can't boil a kettle for yourself and make yourself a cup of tea, or wipe your own bottom after you've been to the loo. But we don't have a very coherent description of why those sorts of needs should be treated differently to the kinds of needs that are associated with more standard healthcare. And we'll say a bit more about that as we go along. It's also the case that when we talk about social care, more often than not when it's discussed in public, we talk about social care for older people, and that's very important. But half of the activity in social care for adults is not about older people. It's about working age adults who have social care needs. And as well as that, there's the social care that needs to be provided for children with social care needs. So we're not as clear as we ought to be about it. And part of that lack of clarity feeds through into the kind of policy model that I think we are in on social care. Social care provision in the UK by the state is entirely means tested. So uh, all social care that's paid for by the state is means tested. This is a slide, that, actually this is, a, this is an old slide that I prepared 10 years ago when we were doing the, the commission. And it just shows the relative scale of the ways in which the state supports elderly people. And I'm mainly going to talk about elderly people for, for the sake of time. I, I'd be very happy during the question session to talk a bit about uh, working age adults, because I think that's a critical thing. These are, these are three key ways in which the state in England spends money on older people. So social security benefits, the basic state pension, uh, and also the means tested elements. So th that's the largest part. And, and, and most of this is not means tested. Most of this is, is the universal state pension that will be being received by quite a lot of people in this room and will be being received by me relatively soon. And then, and then part of it is means tested. Then we have the NHS, 
which is almost entirely not means tested. Of course, there are elements of the NHS that are means tested, although we don't think of them that way. Prescriptions, for example. So prescriptions are free for those on the lowest levels of income and assets and also free in ways that I'm slightly puzzled by for people over the age of 60. Um, I'm still, whenever I go and get a prescription, I'm very puzzled by not being able to pay for it. This seems very peculiar. Um, but, but by and large, the NHS is not means tested. The huge bulk of it is not means tested at all. And then we've got this little bit of social care at the top, which is entirely means tested. And th then there are two things to note about this. The first is that I think if we didn't have a distinction between NHS and social care structurally, then I absolutely guarantee that the balance of spending would be different. We would be spending more on social care and less on the NHS. The, the choice between those two spending forms is affected by them being run separately. Social, social care still runs through local authorities. The NHS runs centrally. The second is that a priori, we think it was very odd that there should be a completely different funding arrangement for the NHS and social care, a completely different sharing of responsibility between individuals and the state across those two things. That's, that's a kind of corner solution, and we've got to try and work out why on earth that could be so, and, and I'll come back to that later. So that, that's kind of background. The, I've worked, as, as Hamish said, I spent 21 years at the IFS working largely on social security policy, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about the structure of means tests. And I should say, by the way, that I don't think means testing is by any means always a bad Thing. It can be a very effective way of targeting support on those who need it most. You could imagine a competition for the most peculiar means test in, in British uh, welfare policy, and there'd be a number of competitors. It would be a, you know, it would be a, it would be a tough competition. But I think the social care means test would almost certainly win. Uh, it is. Uh, it is, it, it's a very extreme... Now, of course, it's complicated because it's both an assets and an income test, and I'm only presenting here the assets aspect of it. But basically, if you've got assets of less than £14,000, and those assets include your house in many circumstances, the state will pay for all of your social care. If you've got assets of between £14,000 and £23,250, which is quite a small slice of the wealth distribution, then there's a taper. And if you've got assets of more than £23,250, uh, thank you, you're on your own. Now, people talk loosely about cliff edges in... in but that, you know, that, I think that's, that's reasonably described as a cliff edge. Um, and it causes uh, anxiety, fear... Uh, it provides a, a significant incentive to cheat. I, I remember while I was doing the Social Care Commission uh, receiving a letter from a pretty prestigious law firm which was titled, Where There's a Will, There's a Way to Get Round the Social Care Assets Test. Um, it, it encourages people to alienate their assets, more or less genuinely uh, causes all kinds of real difficulty. So the structure of the means test is not as it should be, and if we're to continue with a means test, which I think we will, one part of the reforms that we suggested was improving its structure, so uh, essentially uh, bringing this taper all the way down here. I'm not going to talk much about that now. The fundamental core problem with social care in, the, in this country at the moment, though, is that we're just not spending enough on the means-tested system. We're just not putting enough resource in. Let me give you some idea of, of scale. Um, there are about one and a half million people working in the NHS. There are about one and a half million people working in social care. There are about one and a half million people needing social care. State spending on social care in the UK for both elderly and working age adults is about £20 billion, roughly one seventh of the NHS. Over the last few years, Actually, this, this is now a couple of years out of date. Things got, if anything, worse since then. This red line shows you, based on 100, going back to 2010, 11, what's happened to actual spending. This shows you what's happened to spending uh, adjusting for population size. This shows you what's happened to it adjusting for population size and population structure, age structure. Uh, we're spending very significantly less in real terms per person in need than we were. Many fewer people are getting social care than were. The kinds of judgments that are being having that are having to be made by those providing social care at a local authority level 
to allocate these resources. You know, we talk about economics being the miserable discipline. Well, if you're the person in a local authority having to decide how to spend this frankly inadequate amount of money on people who are amongst the most vulnerable in, in our society, then that is almost the epitome of a difficult public sector job. It's a disgrace, and it's something about which we should be ashamed. And this has been true of governments of both political persuasion. So although at the moment we've got a Conservative government, and in the earlier part of that period we had a, 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 a coalition government, it's also been true under Labour governments, that simply inadequate resources have been allocated to looking after the most, some of the most vulnerable people in our society and who simply have no resources of their own with which to have themselves looked after. That is a tragedy and something that we should address and address very quickly. That's the kind of obvious point. Surely the minimum requirement for a decent society is that we should be looking after those who have not got resources of their own which would allow them to look after themselves. We should be looking after them properly. And we're not doing a very good job on that in the UK and we haven't been doing a very good job for some considerable time. I don't think economics has got very much more to say about that particular group. What economics has got something to say about is what we should do about the other two-thirds or three-quarters of the population. And the question there is, well, why on earth should, should we? Is there an argument for doing anything for the rest of the population in the context of social care? And there, I think, there is something really rather important for economics to say, which is not widely understood. Uh, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, as well as economics, is data. And the reason I'm particularly interested in data is that for, for many economic problems, before we can say anything very intelligent, we need to understand what the world looks like, the world that we're interested in. And all too often, that's not the case. Uh, and one of the things that I said year after year at, at, at the Business Summer School in the 80s and 90s was, let's know about it. And it was, in fact, there in 1986 that I first did something I've done thousands of times since, which has made people play a multiple choice question. And the two multiple choice questions I used to do back then were one, to try to get to see whether people understood uh, the shape of the income distribution. And the other was to see whether they understood the shape of the distribution of tax payments. And the answer to both of those was no. And I discovered, and I was astonished by how much they were misunderstood. I spent much of the next 20 years asking those questions to all sorts of groups of people and finding that across all sorts of groups of people, exactly the same misapprehension was there. And it, it didn't matter whether you were talking to a group you'd expect to be on the left or the right, uh, economists or not. I, mean, I had great fun doing it at the Treasury once. Um, uh, all of the bishops of the Church of England, the editors of the BBC's news programmes, you know, just that there was systematic not really understanding what the populations look like, and that, that really matters. The, the really critical question for social care is, well, what's, what's the likely outcome? How much social care are we going to need? You know, if we're all going to need the same amount, then actually it's pretty straightforward. We should each save up enough to pay for it. If we don't know how much we're going to need, if the amount that we're going to need is very variable, then it's a different question. Uh, this is the probability distribution of care costs. So imagine that we took 165-year-old people and we lined them up in order, starting over this side with the fit and healthy who are going to be walking up Snowden at the age of 93, perfectly well, heart attack, gone. No social care need. About the bottom 20% there. So 20% of either lucky or unlucky people, 20% of 65-year-olds won't need any social care before they die. The median person might need six months uh, in uh, residential care or maybe a year of, of some care in the homes, domiciliary care. But then the distribution rises very dramatically and, and is very skewed. Now, if we knew where we were going to lie on that distribution, we'd be fine. We could plan for it. Actually, we have no idea. We, 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 we have no way of telling where we're going to lie on that distribution. But what you can see is that given the very skewed nature of this distribution, that some of us will not need any, some of us will need a bit, but some of us will need an awful lot, this is a classic risk pooling problem. This is something where we don't want to simply stand there and wait. No, nobody says, oh, well, my house might get broken into, I'll save enough 
just in case my house gets broken into. Nobody says, I suppose I might have a car crash. I'll save enough in case I have a car crash. Nobody says, I might live to 120, so I'll save enough so that I've got enough income every year till I'm 120. We pool the risk. And um, essentially what pooling the risk means is that, that we all accept paying a certain amount, which might mean that we're worse off than we would have been if we hadn't paid it, but means that we know that we won't face the tail end risk. And th this, this description, the magic of averages to the rescue of the masses, this was something that Churchill said first in 1908. So Churchill in 1908 was involved with Lloyd George in setting up labour exchanges and bringing social insurance into play. Uh, he said it again in a wonderful speech he gives in March 1943, just at the point when it seemed likely that the Allies would win the war in Europe. And he, had, he, he, he gave a speech describing his what he said was his four-year plan. And much of it is about Europe, but then he gets on to uh, social welfare. And he says, uh, I'm not quoting precisely, but he says, basically, the UK already has a wonderful array of social insurance uh, institutions, but we can and should do more uh, after the war to expand and extend them. And you can count me and my colleagues as staunch supporters of social insurance against every risk for every class from the cradle to the grave. And uh, he then repeats this, he said, as I said in 1908, having worked with this for the last 35 years with my great friend William Beveridge, as, as I said in 1908, social insurance can bring the magic of averages to the rescue of the masses. And this is a key idea in economics. So it's terribly easy to caricature economics about, being a, about individual behaviour massive amounts of our activity are actually not about individual behaviour, they're about communal behaviour of one sort or another. Firms are communal activities, they're a bringing together of people to achieve a certain sort of thing. Insurance policies are a classic example of communal activities, that's, that's what they do. Of course, families and communities can also play a role in this, but not in something, I'd argue, on as large a scale as this. So, so we definitely need to pull risk, uh, just as we wouldn't dream of saying, oh, we'll just, uh, we'll make sure we've got enough saving in case our house burns down or we have a car crash or we, need, or we have a massive healthcare need. We shouldn't be doing that in social care, not least because most of the population couldn't possibly save enough to cover the catastrophic risk. If there are two of you, the catastrophic risk could easily be a million pounds. It's not likely to be a million pounds, but it easily could be. If there are two of you and you both need 10 years of residential care, that's the kind of... So, so we need some kind of communal response to this. Well, the natural communal response is, why doesn't the private insurance sector provide cover for this? That seems like the obvious thing. But then you look around the world, which is also an important thing. So it's good to look at other countries to see... And you find there isn't a country where the private insurance sector is providing this. So, so then you start to think, well, why on earth not? What is the problem? Uh, and the core problem is this. If we knew this was the shape of the curve, the shape and the position of the curve, it'd be fine, because all we'd be dealing with would be idiosyncratic risk. An insurer could say, well, that's the total that's the total possible burden. Of course, you've got some adverse selection and moral hazard problems, but basically, they know what they're dealing with. They can set premiums and you're away to the races. The problem is, idiosyncratic risk is not the only problem here. There's the risk and, indeed, the probability of an, of an aggregate shock. So the standard thought about insurance is you can cope if all you're doing is, is trying to work out where people will lie on a probability distribution that we know. But if there's a chance that the probability distribution shifts, you're technically stuffed. And <laughs> the analogy here is, so anybody in this, so there'll be people in this room with private health insurance. Um, and anybody in this room, probably, most people in this room could get private health insurance. But the private health insurance we could get would be for next year. If we went to the private health insurance and said, what I'd really like is I'd like to pay a premium now and I'd like that to cover me for cover my health insurance in 40 years' time. Well, she'd laugh at us because it would be a ludicrous thing to suggest because of the risk, indeed the probability that over the, over the intervening 40 years, technology would change such that the cost of providing that would be massively skewed. 
and this is really what this is representing. If you've insured, if you provide insurance based on this line, it turns out that by the time you get there, you're on this line, you are completely stuffed. Because although down here the gap doesn't look very big, here it's getting bigger, here it's, here it's getting very, very large indeed. There were a few policies written in the 1990s that offered this. The providers went bust. There is nowhere in the world where you can buy this insurance. There are some policies in America where you can buy this insurance. So you can get insurance for the first part, but it runs out after a certain number of years or a certain amount of money, and you can't get the catastrophic covered. That's where we are in the UK at the moment. We have a means-tested state system, and we have no private cover available. It's not quite true. You can buy a thing called an immediate needs annuity. So at the point where you need social care, you can buy an annuity that will pay for it for the rest of your life. That's a bit like the only car insurance available to you being that at the moment when you have a crash, you can opt to share your risk with everybody else who has a crash at exactly the same moment. Now, actually, that is better than nothing, but it's not a whole lot better than nothing. So where does that leave us? What, what, why is that a problem? Well, it, I'd argue it's a massive problem. So we have no, we have no risk pooling. That means that, that if you're unlucky, you lose everything, and that leads to huge fear and sense of injustice. At least as important, it leads to underconsumption, oversaving and underconsumption. So we have people who are not terribly wealthy trying to have enough in their savings that if they end up in the catastrophic case, they can pay for it. Not ending up in the catastrophic case, because most people won't, and ending up with larger bequests and lower consumption in their lives than they could have had. And this is tragic. We're reliant on a means tested system, wholly reliant on a means tested system with all the problems that creates. It's also very important to think about providers. And one of the great things about the business and economics program is it helps to remind us of that side of the world. We're not just consumers, we are providers. The current system for providers is disastrous. Because if you are a consumer, it's a bit like being in a shop with no prices. You know how much it will cost per week or month to have your care or your mum's care or your grandma's care, but you've no idea how many weeks or months that will go on for, so you don't know what the price is. That means that unless you are extraordinarily wealthy, you will try to buy the cheapest thing that is available and meets the regulatory demand. That basically means the demand curve is flat. There is no producer surplus available, and there is no incentive to innovate or invest. So this massive industry is faced by a, a group of consumers for whom the demand curve is flat, and there aren't, apart from a tiny, tiny number of people for whom a self-insurance lump of a million pounds is plausible, there are very, very few consumers who are willing to buy anything that is new or innovative. That means the sector as a whole is not innovative, despite the fact that the one and a half million people who work in this sector are, almost without exception, extraordinary people doing a difficult and sensitive job with great care and affection and respecting the dignity of the people who they're looking after. But because of this structure, this failure to address market failure, they're almost all on the minimum wage. It's a kind of tragedy. And, and there is uh, an incentive to cheat. So what should we do? We, we have to pool this risk. This is the only large risk that we all face that is unpooled. It's bonkers. It's a market failure of massive proportions. The easiest thing of all to do would be to treat it in the same way as we treat the NHS. Uh, it, the, the, there's, a, there's a curve like this for the NHS. We, we take that, that whole risk together. That would be the easiest thing to do. And there are a few countries that have tried to do that. Some of the Northern European countries, uh, Japan to some extent. Uh, they face problems at the moment because uh, the aggregate shock thing has hit them too. And so it's costing more than they thought it would. The contributions that are being made are not adequate to provide a good enough service. They're charging top-ups as well that are making... You, they've got, you could characterise that as a very difficult world because we've got populations who thought they were going to be provided for and had paid for it, and actually now they're not being. But we perfectly well could do... There's no economic problem with doing this. Uh, it's just that we would have to, you know, we'd have to pay the premium, and the premium would be quite high, because to take the whole risk, we'd probably be talking about 20 or 30 billion pounds of increased public spending. We could do that. 
I don't think that there isn't a party in this country that is willing to say it will do that. And if you're going to do that, you have to make sure you really do it. You've got to take the whole risk. You've got actually to invest enough, because otherwise you're making things worse. So I don't think that's very likely to happen, although I'd be perfectly happy were it, were it to happen and were somebody to, to say they would do it. So I think we're left thinking, well, if we're not going to take the whole risk, is there something that we can do that makes things better? And there was a suggestion a while ago, um, sorry, the colours here don't work very well, from Derek Wanless, um, that what we should do is we should split the costs between the individual and the state. So this red line, so his, his suggestion was that the state should pay the first half and the individual should pay the second half. That would be better than where we are now, but it, it isn't, in my view, the right, the right thing to do. What you're doing is you're, you're paying, you end up spending quite a lot of, of, of public money down here on people who actually have rather low need, and the people up here are still facing an enormous problem. Basically, half of infinity is still infinity. Um, so you, you've still got people facing the catastrophic risk. You haven't taken the catastrophic risk away, and you've spent quite a lot of money down here. So our view on the commission was that the right thing to do was this. So uh, for older people, say that uh, individuals would have to pay the first, we said, £35,000 of their cumulative costs, and then uh, the state would step in and pool the catastrophic risk. So this is social insurance, but with an excess. And we were pretty convinced that this was the optimum. That it was much better to take the catastrophic risk uh, in whole, in, in, entirely and leave people facing the first part of the risk. About a week before we published the report, um, the extremely smart young economist who was working on it came to me and said, um, Andrew, I've just been... Re uh, she was on scum of D from, from DWPC. She said, Andrew, I've just been rereading um, Uncertainty in the Welfare Economics of Medical Care, which is an article by Kenneth Arrow in the American Economic Review in uh, December of 1963. It's well worth... I, I strongly advise you to go back and look at it, partly because it's, it's completely unlike a journal article would be today. So, I mean, Arrow was about the most sophisticated economic thinker of his time, a man of astonishing ability and very, very substantial mathematical sophistication. But you'll see that anybody in this room could read this article. Uh, you might, um, as I did this afternoon, struggle with the appendix, which I hadn't been at for a while. The appendix proves, mathematically, a point that he makes in the article, which is if, if you're going to ensure less than the whole of a risk, it is always the catastrophic bit of the risk that you should ensure. It's always rational, if you're, going to, if you're not going to take the whole of the risk, to take the worst part. And, of course, we can see the intuition behind that. That's obvious. It's much easier to prepare for this than it is to prepare for that. And in, in the face of a catastrophe, you want to get rid of it all. Um, it's a beautiful article, and I thought another wonderful example of the way that, in that case, some very sophisticated economics plays into a really critical public policy issue. That's what we should do. What would that do? Well, we would have consumers who are no longer terrified. That would lead to more money being available to spend and lower bequests. A core part of the object of this is to, is to have people leaving less money to their children, not more. Because on the whole, it's much better for people to consume their own funds than give them to their children. At the moment, we have an incentive to do the reverse. It would lead to care providers actually being able to innovate and diversify, and it would lead to the possibility of much better conditions for the wonderful staff who, who work in this. It would actually produce a world where financial services could start to innovate, and it would reduce the incentives to cheat. I simply can't think of why we wouldn't do this. It's not at the moment the most urgent thing to do, the most urgent thing to do in social care at the moment, is make sure we're paying enough money into the means-tested system. But until we do this as well, we'll be left with a system that simply doesn't work. We'll be left with a system where providers can't act properly, where individuals face enormous anxiety and fear, wholly unnecessarily, and the amounts of money involved are tiny relative to the government's overall budget. To, to, to just put a cap like that in place at the level that the government was going to this autumn would cost about one and a half billion pounds a year out of total government spending of a thousand billion pounds. It is, I think, a stain on our society that we don't look after social care properly, and that's not really an economic statement, 
That's a statement of values. But there is no doubt that economics can help us think about why we need to do something here. There is a massive unaddressed market failure, and it is bonkers not to address those. Uh, to think that economics says anything other than that is wrong. We need to intervene here. It's worth reflecting on why, why can the state do this intervention when the private sector can't? I think the core reason here is that if you're a private insurer, you have to write a contract. And if, if, if what, if, so if you're, if, you've, if you're a private insurer and you've written a contract based on this and this happens, basically you go bankrupt. If you're the state and you've said you'll do this and that happens, you change the rules. You in, and and that's, that's actually in everybody's interests. This is an example where we actually want contracts that can be broken. Because if we haven't got contracts that can be broken, we won't have contracts at all. And that's where we are now. And states do this again and again. Uh, the, the rules of the state pension in the UK have been changed radically at least nine times in the post-war period. And we don't think that's wrong. We think that's an appropriate adjustment to the way that the world has changed. That's why that ability to adjust is why the state can do this and the private sector can't. We should do it, and I think this is just a very clear example of a combination of data telling us what the nature of the challenge is, some economic analysis telling us how we should respond, some more economic analysis explaining to us why the private sector can't do it, and then a beautiful piece of relatively mathematical economics demonstrating what is intuitively true, that if you're going to insure only a part of a risk, you insure the catastrophic risk, and we should just get on and do it. Thank you very much.